Okay, what I'd like to do now is I'm, I'm going to continue on talking about suffix trees and, and assembly with the hopes of getting through assembly today. That is going to be my goal. We'll see if we're successful at it. Okay? Any questions about that? Or the homeworks or anything else before we get started? Okay. So we talked, we've been talking here about suffix trees. And suffix trees, remember, were a tri of all suffixes that you build on a string. The amazing things about suffix trees are, one, that you can build them in time linear in the size of the string. You can store them in space linear in the size of the string. You can search for any string length k. Is it present as a substring in the string in time that's basically order k? These are amazing things, but they're not all the amazing things that you can do with suffix trees. Because if you're clever about using suffix trees, of a variety of other problems with them of algorithmic interest. Okay? We talked about how do you find the common string across two strings. Okay? Last time. That we talked about. We started hinting at the problem of finding palindromes. Okay? We talked met last time very quickly at the end of class about a palindrome. A palindrome is a string that reads the same forward and backwards. Testing if a string is a palindrome is not a hard thing. How would you test if a string is a palindrome? Somebody. Okay. Yeah. For i equals one to n, if a sub i, you know, if s sub i equals s sub n minus i, keep going, bop, 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 and if you don't have a violation, it's a palindrome. So testing if a string is a palindrome is not a hard thing. But finding where, a, and again, I think I talked last class about how they are important in a biological context. Because if we define a palindrome as a sequence equal to its reverse complement, it represents a structure that is going to fold onto itself. We know that A's like to bind with uh, T's and C's with G's. A string that is the reverse complement of itself, okay, would you know would stick to itself, okay, and so finding palindromes that exist within sequences, often there is some biological reason why a palindrome might have evolved, okay, and so detecting long palindromes that lie within the human genome are interesting. Any questions about why they're interesting, or people believe that they're interesting? or anything like that. Okay? They occur as secondary structures, which we talk about here. You can see that somehow if a string is equal to its reverse complement, it will fold up into a nice tight loop because A is going to bind with T and C is going to bind with G. That's the argument that a reverse complement will form a structure. There are other things biologically which reverse complements turn out to be interesting. Yes? In English, the um, palindrome is exactly the same because in English, A only binds to an A. Okay? In in DNA world, sequences bind to their reverse complement. And what I argue is actually we can find DNA palindromes, these reverse complement palindromes, using essentially the same algorithm as we will use to find regular palindromes. Okay? So the two things that I want people to think about is, yes, finding long palindromes in a sequence is interesting, whereas, um, and um, reverse complement palindromes are not that much different algorithmically than regular palindromes. So we'll only talk about regular palindromes here, unless you press me. Any questions? Okay, any other questions about that? So how can we find, we'll now consider the problem of, I give you a, um, what's next? Let's come back here. Boom. How do we find the longest palindrome lying within a sequence? Here is a, here is a sequence, you know, of characters. I want to find where is the longest palindrome in the Bible, so, uh, text characters. How could I find that? Okay, can someone give me an algorithm to find the longest palindrome? in a text based on simple methods like what we've talked about. Any ideas how you would find if there is a, the longest palindrome in a, t in a long text? Uh, 
Yes. Okay, so you want to do some explicit search. You were saying search the whole string is the first is the whole string of palindrome. If not knock something off. That's basically an idea. Although admittedly the hard part case is not when the string is very, very it's palindrome is extremely big. The hard part is when the palindrome is of modest size hidden somewhere in the string. And that's really the case you didn't describe. How might you find the largest palindrome? Any ideas? Okay, what I'm hearing is a, a high-powered way to do it, but that's catching the whiff of a suffix tree, right? He's saying that when you want to sound smart with these algorithm problems, these string algorithms, your first step should be build a suffix tree. And the question now is, what are you building your suffix tree on? You're proposing that we take our original input string S, and then what? Okay, so what you're saying is, really what you're saying, that's a good idea, is to take our string, take the reverse of the string, right, and build the suffix tree of this string. Maybe we have a weird character dollar sign to separate it like we did before. We have our weird character to end it. And now you say this problem smells a lot like what we talked about at the end of last class. At the end of last class, we talked about how you use find the, the longest common string between two strings in linear time, right? And you're saying do the same thing. Because if I have a palindrome, okay, then what's the case? Then if I have a string, if B is my palindromic string here, if I look in my reverse string, P has to be in there also, right? So find the longest string that is in both P, in both uh, S and S reverse, and that is the longest palindrome. Or is it? Does everybody see that there is a problem here? Okay? So what is the how do you understand the idea? Why is it good to find the longest common string between a string and its reverse? How many people see that as a good idea? How many people don't see why that's a good idea? Okay, a couple of people. What is the property of a palindrome? Here we have a, a string that contains a palindrome. Let's say it's a string that says something, madam, something. If I reverse this string, I'm going to get this thing reversed, M-A-D-A-M, -A -A which is the reverse of this, right? Followed by the reverse of this thing. Does everybody see that? And now I ask, what is the longest common string? So the blue and the red, my claim is if madam is a palindrome, which it is, right? It's got to be in both this string and that string, right? And so the longest common string to a, um, what you call it, to our, uh, in, in, a, in, 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 we have a string and it's reversed, is a palindrome, except when it's not. Now, why is it not? Suppose we had another text, okay? Let's say that, let me clear this thing out. Oh, sorry. Let's clear this thing out. Suppose we have a text here of the form, Skeena, and then bop, 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 A, N, E, I, 
S-K-S, right? Everybody agree, and this is junk that's not palindromic, right? If we reverse this string, lo and behold, Skeena is going to be in both the original and the reverse. Does everybody see that? But what's the problem? Certainly it's true that if a string is a palindrome, it appears in both the reverse and the original. But it is not true that just because it appears in the reverse and the original, it is a palindrome. They've got to be in the same place. Does everybody get that idea? Okay. So it smells like the problem we talked about before. Okay. But there is another subtlety here. Is that, yes? What do you mean it has to be in the same place? Meaning, in a, let's think what that means. If we did have, let's go back to my madam example. What does it mean to be in the same place? That's a good question. Here, madam existed in the third character through the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh character, right? What is the right place for madam to appear here, okay? It's got to appear in the, if this is of length n, it's got to appear in the basically 2n minus third place, right? Through the 2n minus seventh place. Does that make sense? Okay. So the problem is if I have skina and axkina, okay, the skina here is not going to appear in a place that is the reverse of that. Does everybody see that? So we really want to know not only that, it, that there is a common string, but there is a common string in the right place. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? So let me show you how this can be done, okay? Everybody now understands the problem now, right? What I claim is we can do this using a bit of magic. I'm not going to completely explain, or barely explain, called the lowest common ancestor, okay? And let's now go and explain it a little bit. Boom. Okay? Suppose we built a suffix tray. Actually, I think, uh, let me just double check just to make sure that uh, I don't have anything to show you here. Okay? Suppose, let's say, we built a suffix tree. The suffix tree is going to be a tree. No one's going to doubt that, right? Does everybody agree with that? Each leaf here represents a suffix. If this was my string, each leaf, remember, had a number, four saying that it represented the suffix starting from the fourth character. Does everybody agree with that? Remember in the suffix tree, every leaf node represented a string. We could keep track of where in the string did it begin, right? So my question is, if I want to find that madam is a, is a um, suffix, okay, is a, um, what you call it? a uh, palindrome. How can I do this in a reverse sense? I claim it's the following idea. Okay? I want to know whether or not... I'm going to look at every character position in my string. Okay? Which there are n of them. And I'm going to ask, is there a palindrome centered in this character? See, madam... Madam is centered in a, in a D, correct? If there is a madam centered in a, if madam, what's the longest palindrome centered in that D? That I claim is going to be the longest match between the string starting in the, if this is the ith position, I plus first position, and the reverse string the AM business here, starting in the something like N plus N minus ith position. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Let's think about it. What I really want to now know is this D, if I now build the string, string, pound, reverse, dollar sign, right? This D here, the eighth position, 
corresponds to something in the what? I think it's the n minus 2n minus ith position. Does everybody get that? Plus or minus 1? That's the right place for it, right? What I claim I really want to now know is the length of the palindrome is going to be the length of the longest match from this position on and this position on. Does everybody see that? The reason madam is a palindrome, well, D is a center character, it doesn't match anything, right? It's because there is a A, A, M, M. Does everybody see that? So the real question that I want to ask here is, for every, for the ith position in my text, what is the length of the longest match starting from the ith position right, and starting from the 2n minus ith position? And the length of the characters that match defines the length of the palindrome. How many people get that idea? Okay. By definition, the reason madam is a palindrome is because centered around the D, there is a string that matches its reverse, okay, for another two characters. And that's why there's a palindrome of five. Two plus one plus two. Any questions? Yes? So you're saying that the right side is already been duplicated from the left side? The right side here, by definition, bef to build my suffix string, okay. I built a string that was my input string, the pound character to separate things, just because it's good housekeeping, and the reverse string of the input. And if I build it that way, then I claim the longest palindrome centered at position I is the longest match that is possible of the suffix starting in the ith position and the suffix starting in the 2i and minus ith position. How many people sort of see that? People don't and have a question. Question. What are you doing with those two pieces? What I want to do now is, I've built the one string. My claim is, if you want to ask me how long is the palindrome centered in this D, it is equal to twice the length of the match from this suffix on down and this suffix on down. So I, my problem reduces to now. Each center position find the length of the longest match from here on out and here on out. Okay? That's what I want to say my problem reduces to. Okay? Does that make sense or no question? For even length palindromes, where do we center? For even length palindromes, it's a little different. Not that different. What's an, an example of an even length palindrome? Ma'am, actually, right? Be a little less polite. Ma'am. Okay. What does that mean? If it was ma'am, then it would be exactly the suffix starting from, instead of from the i plus first position, it's from the ith position. Again, something like the 2n minus ith position. Right? I have two cases to tell. Either there is a center character that, is match, that doesn't match, or there isn't. Right? And I'm going to check each of those two possibilities at each of n spots. The longest match I have trailing from then on gives me the length of the longest palindrome. Any questions about that scheme? How many people sort of see why that works? You shouldn't see how efficient it is yet, but you should believe that it works. Any questions? Now, how much time does it take? Let's look at some extreme world and see what that really is asking us. We have a suffix tree, right? Kabunk, kabunk, here's a suffix tree. We have a particular leaf that corresponds to the leaf's position starting at I, right? We have another leaf starting at n minus i, or 2n minus i, but I think it's, I think is the right index, right? What is the length of the longest match in common between them? 
we have one suffix here and one suffix here, my claim is if we work backwards to who their ancestors are, there is a common ancestor where they first meet, a lowest common ancestor, right? And the interesting thing is that from the root to that point is exactly the start of part of the string that the, um, what do you call it, that, that the st suffix starting in I and the suffix starting in 2NI share. Does everybody agree with that? So if I could find this node quickly and know how deep down it is, that tells me how much is in common between the suffix starting in I and the suffix starting in 2N minus I. Does everybody agree with that? So my claim here is to answer the question of is there a suffix centered around I? The question is exactly reducible to what is the length of the longest common ancestor, the point until they split off between two particular suffixes? How many people see that this is what we want to compute? How many people don't see that this is what we want to compute? Ideally with a question. Yeah, question. We just don't see it. No, M is not. If we have madam, D is the middle character of the palindrome, right? Mad M. Okay? So what I claim is, I want to know what is the common string between the suffix starting here, right after the D, right? And in the, after I reverse the thing, if this is the ith position, there is a corresponding position for that D in position 2N minus I, right? And my claim is that if there is a, the length of the palindrome is governed by what? Here, there had better be an M, right? So this dam is this. This dam is this, right? Does everybody see that? This over here, this M, is this this? This M is in the original string this. And I want to go, how far can I roll back while they equal, right? If it's a space on both sides, I can get even bigger, right? <coughs> but here I happen to have an X, and here I have a Y, and that's where it stops, right? I want to know how far do they match. That is the length of the path from the root to the split-off point. Questions about that? So my claim is the problem reduces to, how can I answer that question quickly? Yes? If you had a string that was M A A A M, is it possible that this will require a length? What is it? M? What is the string? M A A A M. Is it possible to uh, three? Is it possible that it will require a length that's longer than the palindrome? Well, the answer is no, and that's because the question is, can I do something longer than the palindrome? And the answer is no, because that's what I put that good housekeeping pound here is, right? Let's look at it. Reverse this thing. Ma'am. Where is the longest match? The long... Actually, this is an A here, right? The longest match is noticing that going from centered around here, the M matches this M, right? This is I. This one is N, 2N minus I. The key point here is that M matches, but M pound does not match M dollar. Does everybody see that? So you can't report something longer. That's why I have the bounce character there. It's an end of file marker to make sure I don't go, 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 go past where I should be going. Any questions about that? Okay. Yes, question. So which characters do be at that joining point? For which example? Which example are you worried about? The ma'am? Well, that means suffix tree. Just so what this is telling me is, look, 
You, what character is over there at that, that, that joining point? Yeah. In this case, the suffix tree for madam, the thing that is common here is the am. So this is going to be am, right? And the branch is going to stop after am. Because after am, there is am pound. And there is also am madam the other way around. There are two suffixes below it. Okay? And the branching node here represents where is the next character different between the two prefixes. That's what the branching node, node is. Where is there a difference? Okay? So the, the right branch from that point is going to cross over the pound. So in this case, right. So in this case, what is a la labeling in this example? This is probably going to be a pound. No, this is going to be a dollar sign. Because remember, this is the end string, right? This is the end string. So it was madam pound dollar sign. This is probably going to be a dollar sign on the next branch. And this would be a pound over here if I was really building the suffix string. Okay? Any questions? Okay? I don't see how you get Build the oh, suffix. Oh, okay, because it's... it's a, yes, yes, I guess. Okay, now he gets it. Okay, good. Any other questions? about how you get it or not get it. So think about a question, yes. So initially I said that the blue dot over there was D and so it was M A T A M from I to to N minus I. But now you're saying that the red dot on top is A and then Okay, I confess I can't see what dots I have, okay? But the point being here is Again, there's, recognize there's two cases where you have a central character and where you don't, right? You're looking for what is the extension either in, between abutting suffixes or suffixes skipping one if you have a central character. But both of the problems are reduced to basically looking for what is the longest common ancestor, the lowest common ancestor between two specific leaf nodes, okay? You can answer that quickly, you can do this problem. And through some algorithmic magic I am not going to talk about here, you can do it quickly. You can do it in constant time. If you spend the linear time processing the tree, this is magic. Okay? Any questions? How would you find the lowest common ancestor between two of these nodes without magic? Okay? Suppose I give you a tree. I give you two leaves. And I want to find what is the I give you a tree. I give you two leaves, this one and this one. And I want to find the lowest common ancestor, the point where they branch. How could I do that without fancy ways? Yes. So you just do a GFS and then whenever you come back, whenever the GFS returns, you see both the nodes are. Okay, you're saying do some kind of a traversal of the tray. The way I would do it as a simple thing is I would say, to, given my node, walk backwards and color these nodes, right? Color them black. And now walk back from these other ones and say, where is the first black node that I see? That's got to be the lowest common ancestor, right? So finding the lowest common ancestor is not hard, but how much time does it take? Order of the height of the tree, right? And the magic is it is a faster way of doing that. And that is magic, okay? But uh, if you take enough algorithms classes, maybe you'll see that, okay? Any questions here? Okay? But once we know the magic exists, we can use it, right? It's perfectly fine to say, oh, Tarjan tells, tells me that I can find the lowest common ancestor in constant time. Tarjan told me, and I'm telling you, okay? So you can assume that you have this power, okay, even if you don't understand the black box, just like you can assume you can build a suffix tray, even in linear time, even though I didn't tell you how to do it. Any questions? Okay. Put all this together, you can find palindromes, the longest palindrome in linear time in a string. Okay. Any questions? Okay. That had a lot of magic in it, okay? But I think people understand it, or at least basically can appreciate it. Any questions? Let me show you one other application of suffix trees 
to this before we go anywhere else. Okay, and it's a simpler problem. There's less magic involved here. So don't get scared if the magic frightened you. We talked earlier a little bit casually. Someone asked the question, oh, is DNA linear or circular? Why did they ask this question? I suspect they looked ahead in the slides and saw the slide. Okay? Turns out that in, in genome sequences, it turns out that most genomic DNA is linear. It comes in chromosomes, and there is a start, a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end. There are certain DNA segments, however, that are typically short, that have circular genomes, where there is a bonding between them, and they're like a donut. Okay? Any questions? These things are called plasmids. And certain um, parts of cells have these, these sort of small DNA plasmids in them. Things like mitochondria. These are sort of the most famous example, I think. In fact, you know, mitochondria is this little parts of cells that somehow have a complicated history, but they were basically adopted by cells, and they provide energy for cells. And they have their own little genomes, and uh, those genomes are circular. Okay? So there's a question now. If you build a database of circular genomes, how do you put something in so that every sequence only occurs once? Okay? This is the problem I'd like to say. So suppose, let's say, that somebody had a circular genome. We'll talk about a very short circular genome, C-A-T. Okay? Now, GenBank is built to handle linear genomes, right? They're strings. We are used to dealing with strings. We are not used to dealing with donuts in here, right? How can I put this circular string into a database in an unambiguous way, right? I could say, start off, okay, I'll break it. I'll take a bite out of my donut over here. And then I get C-A-T. Does everybody see that? Or the donut does have a direction to it. Or I might have A-T-C, right? Or I might have what? T-C-A. Does everybody see that these are different linearizations of the, the donut? Now, what if I wanted to compare two donuts and to decide if they're the same, right? Here, you know, one guy has, has sequenced a donut. You have sequenced a donut. How can you tell if your donuts are the same thing? What I claim is, it is very, very useful if we can find one place to tell each other to break our donuts so that we break them at the same spot. Does that kind of make sense? Every donut, if it's got n characters in it, has n places to break. If we want to break our donut, I claim we can break any one of n places. It'd be great if we could tell each other to say, agree on the place. Okay? What is the logical place to break a donut string? Okay? Which of these three, CAT, ATC, and TCA, is a logical way to place to break our donut? If we have an order, if we assume that we want a unique way to pick one out, this string is particularly distinctive, ATC. Why is that one distinctive? Why can't you pick that one out of a crowd? Because it's the first in alphabetical order of the three strings. Does everybody agree with that? So if I say to this guy, take your donut, find, so take all possible ways to break that string into strings of length n, pull out the first one in alphabetical order, that's the one we will compare. And now we know we are agreeing with it. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Left to, without an agreement like that, the other guy might pick cat. Maybe he likes cats. Okay? Questions? So there's a problem here that I want to recognize as an algorithm problem. Given a circular string, find a canonical place to break it to leave it as a linear string. Okay? And the obvious place to leave it is the lexicographically smallest one first one in alphabetical order. So everybody kind of agree now on the motivation. So now my question is, given a circular string, 
find the first way to break it in alphabetical order. Can someone give me a simple, straightforward algorithm for this? How would you do this without any magic from this class? Okay, it appeared on me. So one possibility is we break at all places, like we did here, right? That gives us what? N strings, each of which is N strings, each of which is N in length. Does everybody see that? How much time does it take to sort N strings, each of which is N in length? Okay, someone, how long should that be? Somebody, a hand. I hear n squared log n. How can you sort that thing in n squared log n? Well, we've got n keys. We can sort n keys in n log n comparisons, right? Does everybody see that? And each comparison, if I have two strings of length n, each comparison might be, you know, c, both are c, both are a, both are g, g, g. Oops, they disagree in the last position. Each of those comparisons might take n time to give us a total of n squared log n time. Does everybody see that? In fact, there is a slightly slicker way to do it in n squared time using another sorting algorithm. What is the sorting algorithm? Okay, you're saying you want to partition it and, and put this look in the A's bucket, right? But it turns out that half the strings were A's. And so you've gone through and now after you've done all this work, you've now got a big bucket of A's. And now what are you going to do? You're going to throw that all out? It turns out all the A's were next to each other. So it's going to keep getting, so that doesn't actually help you necessarily. Yeah? Okay, what we are, you're saying that you would like to, oh, I see, what you're actually saying is to solve this problem, we don't have to sort it. I think what you may be saying is we don't even have to really sort it. Basically, I'm being sloppy sorting it. We could just find the maxima. How would we do that one? We could compare A against B, first two strings, right? And see who the winner is. I'm ahead of you, right? You go away, and I take the next guy to come to me, Right? And by doing n minus 1 such comparisons, each of which took n steps, that would take, that would find the right one, right? Does everybody see that? That is actually a convincing n squared algorithm. Okay? Any questions? How many people see that? Does everybody now agree we can linearize a string in n squared time? Okay? But I claim with suffix trees, we can do better. How can we do better? What's the first thing to do? Should know to sound smart when it comes to strings. You build a suffix tray. What should we build a suffix tray of? Okay. A trick that seems to work a lot is to attach two strings next to each other, right? Actually, let's turn this off. See what's on the next slide. What if I break the string arbitrarily? I have my donut, cat, and I break it arbitrarily, T, C, A, right? Now, what if I put T, C, A followed by T, C, A, and then I'll put a dollar sign or something at the end, okay? What is interesting about that? Although I broke this arbitrarily, and I broke this arbitrarily, I, I, I repeated it, right? What's cute about that? Yeah? You have all the different breaking combinations. I have all strings of length n as windows here, right? Does everybody see that? TCA, CTA, ATC, they're there, right? So all the strings of length n I want are in the string. And I have to find the one that is alphabetically first. Does everybody see that? Now, where is it? 
If I build a suffix tree, where is it going to be? Remember out here I've got branches for every letter of my alphabet? Which branch is it going to be down? In principle, probably the leftmost inhabited branch, right? Keep going down the leftmost inhabited branch. Okay, or do it reversal. If I do an in order reversal, in other words, the first letter of the alphabet before the second letter before the third, the moment I am n characters deep, I have the first string in lexicographic order. Does everybody see that? So basically, build the suffix straight took linear time. It had a linear number of nodes. A depth first search traversal following the, the edges going out in character order, right? And the first time I find myself n characters deep, I find myself with the lexicographically first one. Any questions about that? How many people see this? Okay? How many people don't see it and want to? A question like, I don't see it, would be good. Question? I actually didn't get the problem. Uh, like, for a DNA sequence, what do you mean uh, alphabetically? So my... There are only four alphabets. There's only four letters of the alphabet. Right. But, but if I have a string of length, you know, here I have a string, G-A-A-T-C, right? What is the alphabetically smallest circularization of this string? Let's look at that. Okay, maybe we'll look at this example. The fact that they have four letters, you're right. If there's an A in it, it's going to start with an A. Right? So in here, it could be two strings start with A. In this case, it looks like, again, let's look at this thing. Here's the dividing point. Okay, actually, let's clear it. I'm sorry. Clear it. Sorry, boops. Clear it. Uh, okay, trouble. Okay, this is trouble here. Good. Here is the first dividing point, right? That's where I put the thing. Any window of size n is going to be it. What is the lexicographically smallest one? I believe it's this going up to the C. Is that right? Yes. And this is what I would find. Everything is going to be a suffix. There is a suffix starting from here, okay, that if I built this tree and searched in lexicographically order, I would search down the A edge, down the A before I hit anything else. The A thing has not a nil pointer now. Then there is a C. There's no AAC. That's going to be a nil pointer. AAG, not there. AAT, good, right? And I'll walk down. The claim is this traversal has to take linear time. The first time I am n characters deep, I am done. Any questions about that? Any questions about linearization of these things? Okay. So this is amazing. Okay. Does everybody see that suffix trees are amazing? There are all kinds of power built in. Once you build a suffix tree and it's a black box that you can use, you can do amazing things. Any questions? Any questions? But there are even more amazing things than suffix trees. Suffix trees are not the most amazing thing. Even more amazing is something called a suffix array. Okay? I see whether it's more amazing is in the eyes of beholders, but suffix arrays are amazing things too. Okay? A suffix array is going to be an even simpler way to represent an index on all the strings. Suffix trees have all these pointers, and all this, you know, they do very powerful, but they're complicated, okay? A suffix array is going to be an array of suffixes where we sort them, okay? So let's consider the text Mississippi, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I, -S 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 okay? That's 11 characters long. There are 11 suffixes, starting from each position and going to the right, right? We can sort these suffixes, right? And we end up getting something that looks like this. Does everybody see that this is 11 suffixes corresponding to each one? And these are all in alphabetical order, right? 
We took the suffixes, we built an array of suffixes, and then we sort them. Okay? Any questions about that? So a suffix array is a um, array of all the suffixes. Okay? It's an array of strings, sorted strings. Any questions about that? What would you do with a suffix array? Suppose I want to now look something up in a suffix array. If I give you this suffix array, and I want to ask myself, sip a substring of Mississippi, how would I go and find that if I'm given an array of suffixes? Somebody with a hand. Okay, I heard the word binary search, right? What does that mean? I look in the middle of my array. And I say pi is sip less than pi, right? Alphabetically, the suffix that starts with sip has got to be in the lower half of the array than the one with pi. Does everybody agree with that? And so I will now say it's not in this part of the array, no sip here. Look in the middle, sis. It's got to be before sis, right? SIP is before SIS. Can't be here, right? My claim is that by doing this after log n string comparisons, I can find whether where SIP would be as a prefix of a suffix in this array. Does everybody see that? Okay. So if I want to do sub suffix search, if I want to do substring searching, if you give me an array of suffixes, I can do binary search on them. And if I'm looking for a string of length k here, I claim that every one of my comparisons, I only need to compare the first k letters of the suffix. I claim that in order k log n, I can find where that suffix is, where that string is. Any questions about that? How many people see this? Okay, this is nice and simple, right? Any questions about that? So that's a suffix array. A suffix array is a good thing. Okay? So the difference is by just looking at, just to repeat what I said. Okay, since every substring is a prefix of some suffix, we can now do a binary search in the array. Binary search in the array takes um, log n steps, each of which is a comparison of length m if m is the size of my string, my query string. And I can find it then. Any questions? Okay. In fact, by storing some other auxiliary information, you can do it faster, but that I don't really care about, okay, for now. Okay, this is as a piece of trivia or interest, interest in these algorithms. You'll look up why that is. Okay? The important thing is I can build, I can search this suffix array quickly once I build it, okay? And I can do all kinds of other things I could do with suffix trees. Suppose I wanted to find out how many occurrences there are, okay? Let's go back a little bit. Suppose I want to find out how many occurrences there are of the string um, SI. SI occurs twice in Mississippi, right? M-I-S. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S 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 occurs twice, right? What does that mean? If I looked for a binary search for where SI was found, right? In log n steps, I would find the, uh, what you call it? Where it is. I claim that by either, do, by doing another, you know, th there are a couple different ways you could do this. But by doing, by, certainly by walking up till it differs, I would be able to count how many occurrences there are in time proportional to the number of occurrences. Or being more clever, by doing a binary search, doubling, you know, a, a one-sided binary search, if you know what that is. Or searching for SI, mi just before SI, and just after SI. I could find the indices with which these things lie. So I can not only find out whether it occurs, I can tell you how many times it occurs in basically binary search time. 
Any questions about that? So these are good things, right? They do a lot of the things that suffix trees can do, right? They sound simpler, right? Only how much space does it take to store a suffix array? I hear the word n squared, right? If I'm really going to represent it by an array of n strings, each of which is up on average n over two characters long, then I claim I'm in trouble, right? It's going to take quadratic space to store this thing, right? Is there a trick I can use to compress it? Do I need, yeah? What if I store indices? What if I just keep Mississippi, okay? And the amazing thing is just those numbers, the starting positions of each suffix. If you give me the sorted starting positions of each suffix, just that and the actual string, I get all the information in a suffix array. Why is that? What is the character that starts this string? Well, this string is starting from the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th position. That string is this 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth character. Does everybody see that? Once I have this index number, okay, that is a pointer into the string of where it is. If you now want to do the comparison, there's no reason to have a second copy. You just correspond, go back to the, you know, use the original string. And this is exactly the same trick, basically, as we used with the suffix, with the suffix tray. Does everybody see that? So the amazing thing, the really amazing thing is to build a search index, okay, that gives you all the power that we have here. All you need, essentially, is the string and the sorted list of integers. Okay? And now you can do substring search quickly. Any questions about that? People see how that works? This to me is very slick. It's kind of an amazing thing, right? Okay, very little memory. It's just n integers plus the original string. And now you've got an index on it. Okay? Any questions? Of course you've got to build the suffix array, right? We agree it's not going to take too much space. How do you build a suffix array? Okay, can someone give me a, a way to, what is the simplest way to build a suffix array? Yeah? Okay, I'm not sure I'm following that. What's clear is that we need to, the key is we need to be able to come up with the ordering of these numbers. That's the building the suffix array. The string is the input. The building of the suffix array is the ordering of those characters, right? I claim we could do it in n squared log n time by sorting these strings explicitly, right? That's what we, would, we, we talked about last time. We could do it slightly faster by using radix sort. That would have been n squared time to explicitly sort all those strings. But even n squared is bad if n is the size of the human genome. Does everybody agree with that? There is a particularly slick way to build a suffix array, however, which is first build a suffix tray. If we build a suffix tray, okay, how could we build these things? Okay. Well, if we build a suffix tray, then we want to pull off the strings in lexicographic order. How do you pull these things off in lexicographic order? That circularly string linearization idea gave you the idea, right? We're going to do an in-order traversal of the suffix tray, right? And just simply report the leaves in the order we encounter them. Okay? Do you see that? Okay? So the amazing thing is that if you have a suffix array, suffix tray, you can build the suffix array in linear time. If you believe me, you can build a suffix tree in linear time. 
You can build a suffix array in linear time. And it turns out there's other algorithms for building suffix arrays in linear time. So you don't actually have to go through this intermediate step. That's actually a relatively recent result. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? What's the benefit of the suffix array over the suffix tree? So what is the bit? Why do we want suffix arrays instead of suffix trees? There's a couple of different uh, things. First, the main difference, the one that really is where the money is, is has to do with size. Okay? We agreed that suffix trees took linear space. Suffix arrays took linear space. But there is more junk being stored with pointers and stuff like that with suffix trees. In practice, if you build a suffix tray, you end up with something that takes typically about 17 n bytes to store a string of length n. A suffix array would take only about 3 n bytes. Okay? And this matters. If n is the size of the human genome, this is the difference between whether you get away with 4 gigabytes or whether you get away with 24 gigabytes. Does everybody see that? Okay? So that is one reason. The other is this a, a suffix tree is pretty, the suffix tree arrays are pretty conceptually simple. And there seem like certain things that are just more logical than, you know. Anyway, it, it's a question of taste, but the main issue is space. Okay? I would say ease of thinking about it and then space. Yes? In order to build a suffix array, we have to build a suffix tree, which takes 17 n. So you're saying, well, wait, if you have to build a suffix tree first, where's the space savings? Well, one thing is you could build it and throw it away, right? So you borrow somebody's machine to build the, uh, human, the suffix array. And then you store, when you download in GenBank, you just download the suffix array, right? And suddenly your space problem has gotten worse, better. The other problem is that, it's th that there are more space efficient ways to build suffix arrays than this, okay? And so that would be the other answer that I would give. You always could sort the suffixes, right? And if you do sorting suffixes in a clever way, Maybe you can build it for, still build it efficiently while not paying anything more than basically the space needed for sorting. Okay? So, I want to argue there's other ways you might build it, but this should give you a good introduction to the magic of all these indices. Does everybody see that? Any questions about it? Okay? So, suffix arrays are useful things. Okay? Suffix trees are useful things. Theoretically, suffix trees are more useful things because you can do these other algorithmic things probably easier. In practice, suffix arrays are probably pragmatically a better thing, okay, just because you use less space and uh, they're easier to think about. Any questions about that? Any questions of why suffix arrays are good things, what they are and why they're good things? Any questions? Any questions about any of these indices or the algorithms associated with them. Okay? So you should agree this is a good thing to do. And it is right. Okay. So what do I say next? Now why am I telling you all this, though, in a world where we're supposed to be thinking about sequence assembly? Remember, that's what we're doing here. How might we use suffix trees or suffix arrays for sequence assembly. Does anybody have any ideas? Okay. What is it like? Should we make our string on? What is our string? Or what is our, yeah? You're trying to find overlaps, right? Right. So what, really what we're trying to do is to find out, we have a, a set of reads, remember. These strings that were historically about 500 characters long, right? So we've got strings that are of length about 500. We've got a zillion of them, okay? Or to be precise, if in Solera's world, we had about 20 million of them, okay? And what we wanted to do was to go through these and identify which strings had long overlaps, suffix overlaps with another prefix overlap. Does everybody see that? Okay? So what might be interesting here? Okay? What kind of a string or strings might we want to feed to a suffix tree or suffix array? Okay? 
I argue it becomes very, very interesting if we feed either as separate strings or concatenated by these pound signs, okay? What if we build a suffix tree, let's say, of all the reads, okay, where each read was separated by a pound, so we don't have ever read over it, right? What I claim we're interested, if we now do a depth-first reversal of this tray, what are we interested in? We are going to be interested in any place where we are pretty far from the root. Okay, let's say we care about all pairs of strings that overlap by 100 characters, right? What does that mean? Build the suffix tray. Do a depth-first reversal of this thing. Whenever you find yourself 100 characters deep and you have multiple strings below you, these are probably fragments, these fragments share a string of length 100 in common, right? If the only way that is likely to happen is by chance, is, you know, is if they are really from the same fragment. These are the interesting things to look at more carefully. Does everybody see that? Okay, and so I claim the following algorithm basically identifies all pairs of fragments that are interesting to us. Build the suffix tree or suffix array, okay, on all fragments. Do an in-order traversal, if it was a suffix tree, meaning bop, 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 right, like this. Okay? Or if it was a suffix array, search them from top to bottom and group them by prefixes in common. For when they share the first hundred letters of prefix in common, right? My claim is that this will group together all fragments that have long strings in common. Okay? And these are the ones that basically overlap in interesting ways. Okay? And if our length of overlap that we check is long enough to be very interesting, meaning it's very unlikely to occur by chance, and yet likely to occur given the sequencing error rate and all this kind of stuff. Okay? My claim is we will find all intersected overlapping pairs in time linear in the size of the input. Okay? That's really the idea that I'd like to say. Basically, build this suffix tree or array then traverse it in linear time and report anybody, okay, whose common string is interesting enough. Linear time to build, essentially linear time to report. Okay, I'm being a little sloppy here, but I think that the, the basic idea should be that at that point it's basically any deep enough node that has different strings under it, okay, meaning a degree more than one, okay, is going to be interesting and worth further study. And there are not going to be that many of them unless they're real overlaps, and so we can afford the time to look at them and look at them carefully. Any questions about that? How many people see the idea? People don't get the idea, want to get it more. Okay? This is why we are going to use suffix trees or suffix arrays here. Okay? Because they will organize our fragments into bunches which have long enough things to be overlaps that we can do a little magic however we decide to implement our assembler. Right? At that point, we get the engineering issue of what you do with them. But it's basically about detecting overlaps. Any questions? Yes? <coughs> when you're making the suffix tree from the combined fragments, um, I'm just wondering, you're going to have, you're going to see the pound sign multiple times through the tree? Okay, right, so the, right in this case, the pound sign, if I did what I just told you to do, where I built my string as string, first fragment, pound, second fragment, pound, third fragment, pound, yes, there's going to be a lot of, of um, pound signs in the tray. But we're interested in what? The longest overlap that does not go through a pound sign. Okay. Right? If an overlap goes through a pound sign, 
We don't care about that, right? That was something that you left out. So, so that I left out. That's a detail we would want to worry about. And it is going to be potentially a problem. But we agree that it shouldn't be that hard for me to do so. Okay? Because basically for every string, I know, you know, I, I, I can annotate each string with does it contain, you know, each of my edge labels, does it contain a pound sign? And that's one extra bit per node. And I can say once I have that, I'll know never to go traverse deeper than that. Okay, so that is a, that is a, you're correct. It's a detail I can do it. So you go down the suffix tree until you you find until, the until I until I go deep enough. To be, I, I will backtrack the moment I go through a pound sign. I will keep going until I only have one child below me, or I backtrack, or I am a hundred characters deep, or k characters deep. And once I am deep enough and have still have somebody beyond me and no um, pound sign in the common branch above me, then I will say these are the overlapping fragments. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? So the basic theme is build a suffix tree and traverse it. And that does the whole thing for me. Any questions? Okay? And these suffix trees are amazing things. Again, they're used a lot in... Um, any kind of text index, suffix trees are a good things to do. You're going to go work with Google. Google undoubtedly has suffix trees lurking somewhere in Google. Okay? Any questions? One guy who took my class went to work for a business, you know, went to work for Morgan Stanley or something like that after did three days into his internship. He said suffix arrays and it solved the problem that they had. So these are useful things to know about. Any questions? Okay? Fair enough. So what other, yes, questions? Are these relatively new in technology or just... How old are suffix trees and suffix arrays? Um, the suffix tree was invented about 1973, if I remember correct, okay? So whether this is new or not depends upon your life perspective, okay? <laughs> so uh, suffix trees are, you know, somewhat, you know, not, they're not ancient, but they're not new. Suffix arrays... That's a suffix tree. A suffix array is a newer thing. That's like about 1990. Now, what's interesting is the guy that invented suffix arrays, there were two of them. One of them um, was, if you remember, I pointed out this, the, this computer scientist who was third in the author list of the human genome. Gene Myers was one of the inventors of the suffix array. And he went on and did sequence assembly. So I know suffix arrays are lurking in the Solera assembler, OK, because this was one of his big things. Yes. Do you know why I wouldn't have, I mean, I've been involved with computers since... Why well, haven't you heard of this? Well, this is because this is graduate school, okay? You're supposed to... What, well, what, I mean, what? I took algorithms class and I... Okay, so this is a more specialized topic. You do this in a first-level algorithms class. But if you study string algorithms, which is a worthy topic for study, this is not an alien... You know, a, a, you take, read a book on string algorithms, this will be a popular topic in the string algorithms book. I assume this, if you look in the index of Corman's book, the CLR book, they probably talk about this. My favorite string algorithms book, if you're really interested in this, my favorite string algorithms book is by a guy named Gus Field. Okay? I, I left it on the handout the first day of class. I gave you the reference to this thing. That's the best book on I would say, string algorithms. And that would be going in detail about how you build these things and what you do with them. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Any questions about suffix trees or arrays? We have a few minutes left and I'm going to use them. Okay? But I want to make sure people understand the suffix trees or arrays. Any questions? Okay. A few details now about sequence assembly. And then I want to say finish with sequence assembly. One issue is how long an overlap. We agree that what we're looking for are a fragment pair with a significantly long match. How long a match becomes interesting, okay? I want to say that if genome sequences were random strings, if you had a random string of length n, how long would it be before a string would be likely to occur more than once, okay? If we think about the human genome, how many people think A occurs more than once in the human genome? Yeah. AC. Yeah. AT. Right? 
On the other hand, how long can you go before it is surprising if something occurs? Right? If we think about it, what is the likelihood if I start listing a string? What is the li every time I make it one character longer? I claim I make it one fourth as likely to occur. Does that kind of make sense? Or the number of expected number to be precise, the expected number of times it's going to occur is going to go down by a factor of four. Does everybody realize that? So the expected number of occurrences is going to be n over four to the k. Okay, is the expected number of occurrences here, right? This is assuming an alphabet of size 4. In English, it's much less likely because the English alphabet is 26 letters, right? So long words are even less likely to appear, right? So what is the critical point where a string is going to occur once? It's about the place where n over 4 to the k is equal to 1. What is that going to be? k is going to be equal to log 4n. Does everybody see that? It's how many times do we double until it occurs once. So in a human genome, if n is 3 billion, log base 4 of 3 billion, by the time you get to about 16 or so, strings don't occur, aren't expected to occur in the human genome. So by the time you get the, you know, that's if it was a random string. It's not quite, it's not a random string. There are duplicates all kinds of chunks. But it should be clear that the, the length of an interesting string is 16, 20, 25, something in this range. Okay? So that's the, the length of what we're going to be looking for to avoid duplicates, especially in a world where there's sequencing errors. Right? We might look for, a, if there were no sequencing errors, it'd be good to look for a match of length 100. Right? But in a world of sequencing errors, this is long enough to be interesting and also likely to exist between sequencing errors. So this whole scheme will work. Any questions? OK. What other sequencing assembly tricks do we have? OK. There are lots of different problems that occur in pragmatic assemblers that you've got to worry about. One problem is, repeats, a big problem is, that because the genome is not random, but we happen to have a genome that consists of one long string followed by an almost exact copy of that. These repeat regions are what's hard to assemble, OK? And so if you build your assembler, saying, oh, I'm, there's not going to be any repeats. It's, you're going to get fooled in these regions, okay? So a lot of the energy goes into this kind of thing, okay? Any questions? There's other kinds of data that you can bring into the assembly that also help you. I don't think I want to go through the details of that right now, okay? Maybe read through the slides and see here. There's typically what you have are, um, you know, I mean, you know, you may try to get extra information about certain regions. Like say that you take one fragment of a molecule and you sequence this end and this end. And now you get 500 bases here and 500 bases here. But if you know that the original molecule was about 10K bases, you know not only is this a substring and this is a substring, but these two are probably about 10K bases apart. If you put them 100,000 bases apart, you made a mistake, right? Maybe you can use this to help order things. Yes? This is the mate pairs thing that he was talking about in the lecture the other, you know, Mishra was talking about in the lecture. These actual mate pairs are very, very important to actually put the big pieces together. Actually, the reason they're, they're, they're really important is because if you didn't have that, what would you likely have as an assembly? Here was your original sequence. There were repeat regions and stuff like that. You would probably come up with chunks that are properly assembled between the regions. But you have no idea whether this is to the left of that, right? On the other hand, if you have a mate pair that spans from here to here, right? 
Now you know that this chunk containing this piece has to be on the five prime end of the chunk containing that piece. Does that make sense? So what these mate pairs are really good at is there's regions that are easy to assemble. There are chunks that are, you know, you want to order the chunks, these mate pairs across it, provide a scaffold to order the chunks on. And that, that gives you a global view of what you're doing instead of just a lot of pieces. Any questions about that? Does that seem plausible? Should be clear, more information can only help you because you can always ignore it if you wanted to, right? And it turns out the question is, what can they give us experimentally? That is one thing they can give us that they, it turns out they better give us because that makes a big difference. What else can I tell you about assembly? Let's not talk about gel reading. Um, Basically, like I was saying, the way real assemblers work is that they basically do something like this. They start by building, um, doing what we talked about, shortest common superstring, to build long sequences of the easily, re uniquely reconstructed chunks of sequence. Okay? If we find that one of the chunks of sequence occurs too many times, more than you would expect by random sampling, that is probably a repeat region. And that's sort of a trigger to you that this probably, a, you know, there's something here that you got to fix, right? What else do we have here? Okay. Um, let's go next. Sorry about this. Uh, we build these things. We can use these mate pairs. That's what we were talking about here, right? Mate pairs. And use this to, ch to align the chunks of pieces to give us sort of a scaffolding, an ordering of the fragments. And maybe now that I know this chunk is here, and this chunk is here, and there's probably not that much stuff between them, maybe now I can go back and find fragments to fill in that gap. Okay? And so there's now this engineering aspect of how do I do that kind of thing. And this is now what I'll call engineering and art, rather than, you know, fundamental algorithms. Okay? It's clear you've got to do something like that. It's sort of an ad hoc kind of a thing. Okay. What else do we need to know about assembly? There's a bunch of other tricks that groups did. Again, the original big success story of assembly was when the human genome was sequenced. There were two different groups that were racing for it. One was this private company named Solera. And they got, you know, a hundred million dollars from investors and said, we're going to sequence it, we're going to own the genome, and we're going to patent everything. Then there was the government lab that said, we're going